So now next topic, the removal of the old, which explains the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls. So now the 40 year period that followed the crucifixion was a very troublesome time in history that people have not learned about because of wrong interpretation of Bible prophecy. Now the Israelites completed, completely corrupted themselves and did not follow the instructions of Moses. They rejected God and called for themselves a king. So their nation went down, 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 and led to their captivity in Babylon. Um, Isaiah 43, 14 says, Thus saith the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I have sent to Babylon. Okay, so Babylon was taken over by the Medio persians but they inherited the spirit of Babylon. And then the Greeks took over, and then Rome. They make up this image of the beast ruled by the Babylonian spirit. And Satan, the dragon, is the power behind it all. So Satan and his seed infiltrated the worship system that would bring forth the Christ. Israel not only ignored the warnings of the prophets, they killed them, and in 457 BC, Jerusalem was taken over by Babylon. That event only foreshadowed the burning and the total destruction of the temple in 70 AD. The Ark of the Covenant disappeared during the captivity, but they invented their own system of worship without an Ark behind the veil in the Holy of Holies. God was not in it anymore. It was not a system of worship anymore. It actually marked the beginning of the removal of the old, and from the cross to 70 AD was the climax of the removal of the old. Okay, so the Israelites instituted their own system of worship, right? With Pharisees and Sadducees, and they now worshipped that system. They returned from exile, and the temple was rebuilt by the wicked King Herod, who was appointed by Rome, and he was not even a Jew. He was also the one who massacred a whole generation while trying to kill the baby Jesus, just like Pharaoh in Moses' day. Do you see? They created their own system of worship. No more Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. No presence of God. He was not in their system, but they just carried on with it. And then, in the time of Jesus, they allied with Rome to conspire together against the Christ. I'm going to read Psalms 2, 2 through 3. So listen very closely. It says, The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Also in 1 Corinthians 2, 8, it says, Which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Okay, so now Jesus was manifest and had to face serpent seed within the law system that was now totally corrupt. He made it clear who they were in these scriptures. Matthew 12, 34. Brood of vipers, how can you be evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And then in Matthew 23, 29 through 36, it says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous, and say, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore, you are witnesses against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up, then, the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zacharias, son of Berechiah, or something, <laughs> who you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. And then again, in Matthew 3, 7 says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers who warn you to flee from the wrath to come. He calls them serpent seed, brood of vipers. Okay, now when Jesus came out of the wilderness, it says in Luke 4, uh, that Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out through all the surrounding regions, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. So I'm going to read this verse to you. It says, So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and his custom was he went into synagogues on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. 
and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the broken heart, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of, the, uh, recovery of sight to the blind, to set a liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So now that was three and a half years before the cross. So in the Lord's day. And notice that came from the scroll of Isaiah 61. And he stops at to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. If you read on, it says, And the day of vengeance in 61. So, so there's a reason he does not read that part. He read the first part and he says, this has been fulfilled. But he was giving them time to repent, to accept him up to the cross. Then the day of vengeance would not come, but they never did repent. And before he goes to the cross, he even cries out, O oh, Jerusalem, the one that stones and kills the prophet said to her, how I long to gather you, but you were not willing. That was in Matthew 23. And then in Matthew 24, he says how the great tribulation would come upon that generation and lays it all out for his disciples, that day of vengeance. And so from the cross to 70 AD, it was 40 years, a generation. And first the city was burned and then the temple. If you remember Daniel, he says this will be upon your people, upon the city and upon the temple. Now, all the prophets spoke about the day of vengeance, that great and terrible day, the great troublesome time, the great tribulation. The day of vengeance, they're all, uh, there's like lots of prophecies on it if you search it out. I'm going to read a few. Um, let's see, we'll start with Malachi. It says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. Now, uh, that was the prophecy of John the Baptist coming before the great and terrible day of the Lord was the prophecy of his coming. Okay, now look at um, Luke 1, 16 through 17. It's the prophecy of John the Baptist. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, uh, remember, John the Baptist said, hey, you serpent seed, you vipers, have you come to flee the wrath to come? And then the, the Pharisees and stuff, they even start wondering, are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? They even wondered, is this it? Is this the one in the scrolls prophesied about? Look, they all knew it was coming one day because they knew the scriptures, but yet they were blind. So um, just, I'm gonna read some scriptures off to you, just kind of showing this stuff. Well, I'm gonna give you the reference. On some Isaiah 13 6 Malachi 4 5 I read which was behold I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great dreadful day of the Lord you got Joel 1 15 Amos 5 18 Zephaniah 1 7 there's Jeremiah 46 10 it says for this is the day of the Lord God of hosts a day of vengeance that he may avenge him of his adversaries and the Lord and the sword shall devour and it shall satiate and made drunk with their blood and then uh, Jeremiah 51, 6, flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her a recompense. Uh, so the day of vengeance, it's a time period of the final removal of the old and is described in the book of Revelation from 6 to 20. So it was the day of vengeance that came like a thief in the night of which the prophets warned Israel about. And Jesus referred to this time in Matthew 24, Luke, Mark, it, it all correlates with the visions of Daniel. It was the time of great tribulation, as was never seen before, nor will be. So, again, like I said, Jesus did not finish reading the scroll of Isaiah to pronounce the day of vengeance, because they still had time to repent, but they didn't. They killed the Christ, and they brought that day of vengeance on themselves. The transition from old to new is going to be divided into the three sets, the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls. So, as the Son of Man, God dealt with man's redemption from sin, which included the removal of the old system, which they could not let go of. So, 
uh, Daniel's prophecy in Daniel 9. He said it would be upon Daniel's people, the city, and the temple. So you got seals 1, 2, 3, and 4. It's Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. The four horses, uh, the prophets would say the four winds. So um, if you look at Daniel 10 and 11, it shows that. And then um, number 5, it's the voice of the martyrs crying out, How long till you avenge our blood? And he says, just a little while longer. So then you got um, number six seal, it's the crucifixion. Uh, seven, it's the sealing of the 144,000, the 12 tribes. So seals one, two, three, four. It's the angel Gabriel revealed to Daniel the world history that led up to the Messiah. It was a period of 490 years. So in the last chapter of Daniel, the angel commands Daniel to seal up the visions and rest with the Father. So, these seals had to be opened in the last days, and we find the opening of the seals in Revelation 5. He was told to seal it up and, because those visions weren't time yet. So, But the time had come when the Lamb, resembling the crucified Christ, was able to loose the seals. But then in Revelation 22, we see John is told to seal not the sayings of the prophecy of the book, for the time is at hand. So Daniel's told, seal them, because the time isn't yet. Then John, he says, now write and don't seal, because the time's now at hand. So if you look at uh, the sixth seal, we're going to take a look at it. Um, if you look at Luke 23, Jesus is hanging on the cross, and it says a great multitude of people that followed him were there, women, lamenting, mourning. So, okay, so I'm going to read um, Luke 23 to you. It says, but Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren wombs that never bore, and breasts which never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. So what does it say in the sixth seal when we read it in Revelations? Well, let's look at it. It says, and the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, mighty men, every slave, every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide, on a, and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? So, if you remember in Matthew 24, he says, Woe to the nursing mothers and babies in those days. Because, I mean, you guys, this was the worst time ever, just as Jesus prophesied that it would be. Such a great tribulation that was never seen or ever will be seen again. I mean, if you think of all the different wars and holocausts and any horrible time you can think of, and all those were nothing compared to what happened upon the people in the city at that time. So, again, looking at the sixth, the sixth seal, it says, The sun became black like sackcloth. In Luke 23, Jesus on the cross, it says it was about the sixth hour and there was darkness all over the earth until the ninth and the sun was darkened. Also, sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. In Matthew 27, Jesus is on the cross and he cries out, the veil is torn from top to bottom and there's a big earthquake, rocks split, graves were opened. Also, sixth seal, it says, the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs. Remember, sun, moon, stars are all symbolic language that represents Judaism. It's the fall of their system. So, the fig tree, it means I'll do it my way. In the garden, Adam and Eve used the fig leaves to cover their nakedness. He got Jesus cursing the fig tree and it withering away and him saying, no one shall ever eat from you again. It was that system they created doing things their own way. It did not bear the fruit when it should have. And it was utterly destroyed, just like what was done to the fig tree, cursed, destroyed. So now, uh, before the seventh seal, it says John saw uh, four angels holding back the four winds until the 144 were sealed on their foreheads, which was the 12 tribes. So uh, now God protected all the Christians, the ones that kept his words and instructions that uh, Jesus gave them in Matthew, uh, Mark, Luke, to flee to the mountains of Judea when the trouble started in 66 AD. So they survived that calamity and destruction because they heeded his warning. So the seventh seal is the prelude to the seven trumpets. Now we're going to talk about the seven trumpets. 
When Jesus came on the scene, Israel was desperately in need of a savior because life was unbearable under Roman oppression. Rome ultimately wanted their city, Jerusalem, and the Jews received no mercy from Rome. The persecution grew in intensity and the abomination was set up in the city around 66 to 68 AD by Nero, sparking the last revolt that in turn led to Rome surrounding Jerusalem with 10 legions of soldiers. The trumpets blowing were the unleashing of destruction and calamity upon the city. Jerusalem was totally cut off from the outside world. No one could enter or leave the city. If they dared to leave, they were crucified. Uh, Josephus recorded that the hills outside of Jerusalem were covered with uh, crosses as far as the eye could see and, the, and that the stench was unbearable. It was unbearable. <laughs> okay, so now on the inside, the city was divided in three factions under three zealot fighters, Simon, John of Giscala, and the high priest Eleazar. The symbolic language when it comes to interpreting these trumpets. Every time something happened, a third of something was destroyed. The city was divided into three camps, John of Gascala, Simon, and Eliezer, the high priest. So I'm going to read Revelation 16, 19. It says, And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. The battle for power was within and without. This was also found in the Song of Moses. Okay, so if we look at like the fifth trumpet, it talks about these locusts, and it says these locusts, they have uh, the shape of them like horses prepared for battle, and uh, they had something on their head like crowns and faces like the faces of men and, and breastplates like iron. These are the Roman soldiers. This is what it's talking about. So we have to understand, uh, Revelation is a spiritual language, just like Joseph and his dream of the wheat bowing to him, and the sun, and the moon, and the stars, and, and Joseph interpreting the cupbearer's dream, and the baker's dream, and Pharaoh's dream. So you also got King Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and Daniel interpreting it, and Daniel's dream of the beasts, and it's, it's not actual stuff, it's spirit language. So there was interpretation needed because people didn't understand the spirit language of dreams and visions. So um, Revelation, it's not a future event. This can all be really interpreted through the Bible. You can see the pictures. So um, there is also this passage in Joel 2 about the locusts and showing its army. It's not locusts, like bug locusts. Um, and Joel 2, it says, um, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. So these armies are uh, locusts like, sent with the purpose to destroy. Um, so then you got the seventh trumpet, and I think the seventh trumpet is pretty clear. It's the kingdom being proclaimed. So um, we're going to move on to the prelude, the last step to the removal of the old, which is about the bowls. Um, the removal of the old uh, temple uh, and everything came to an end. So. Okay, so now notice in Revelation 15 it says that they sang the song of Moses, end of the Lamb. So all that happened to Israel was given to them in a song that Moses wrote and sang to them before he departed. So God commanded Moses to write this song and told him that Israel would send themselves bankrupt after his death. So the song revealed that, and that their latter end would be that of devastation. So I'm going to read some of it to you. Um, the song revealed this. Okay, so look at Deuteronomy 31, 19. Now therefore write this song for you and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. And it shall come to pass when many evils and troubles are befallen them that this song shall testify against them as witness. Moses therefore wrote this song the same day and taught it to the children of Israel. So I'm going to read you some parts of the song. It says Deuteronomy uh, 32.5, They have corrupted themselves. They are a perverse and crooked generation. It says they provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see that their end shall be. For they are a very forward generation, children in whom is no faith. 
It says, For a fire is kindled in my anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her incense, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Uh, this was about well, mountains of rulers. Okay. 24. They uh, shall be burnt with hunger and devour with burning heat and with bitter destruction. I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them with the poison of serpents of the dust. 25. Um, the word without and terror within shall destroy both the young man and the virgin, the suckling, also with the man of gray hairs. Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. For their vine is of the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. To me belongs vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. And Moses came and spake all the words of this song in the ears of the people. So they sang the song of Moses and the Lamb, indicating that it was the time that Moses sang about. The song of the Lamb is, and they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and you have redeemed us to God by your blood, and out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. So that's pretty neat. Okay, so we're going to move on to the seven bowls. Um, first, I want to say that, like, so Rome didn't actually want to burn Jerusalem down because they actually wanted to keep the city intact for themselves. It was really known as the greatest city in that world, in the world. So the final burning down of the temple, um, it was like the most terrible, horrible event. It even talks about how Titus threw his hands in the air, exclaiming, this is no work of a man. Nobody expected what was going to happen there. It was really total chaos. So um, the temple, guys, was actually like the heartbeat of the city and their worship. Literally, everything centered around their worship and their temple. Um, so with the seventh bowl, um, it was the total ending of that temple. So... Uh, it was the quickest work. It says it was destroyed in one day. It happened in such a way that no one could stop it from happening. It was such a big blow that it completely took out Judaism. So um, I was going to read some scriptures about that quick work real quick. It's in Isaiah 9.14. It says, Therefore the Lord will cut off from Israel head and tail branch and rush in one day. Isaiah 10, 17, And the light of Israel shall be for a fire, and his holy one for a flame, and shall burn and devour his thorns and his briars in one day. Um, Isaiah 47, 9, But those two things shall come to thee in a moment in one day, the loss of children and widowhood. All right, so um, with the seventh bowl, it's announced it is done. The whole removal of the old from Babylon to the last bowl from uh, to, up to 70 A.D., um, it's that complete removal of the old. So you'll see it from start, started in Babylon, it ends here, and this is, I should write it up here. It's done in 70 AD. That's when it's done. The complete, whole finish of the removal of the old. Started here, and it was taken out and finished and done in 70 AD. So, worlds. So, when we talk about um, the end of the law world, what do we mean when we say that? So, listen, there is three worlds talked about, and each world had a heaven and an earth, and principles that govern them. So, heaven, it says, is my throne, and earth is my footstool. So, throne is a place of authority. It's executed on the earth. So, heaven my throne and earth is the footstool so governing principles so the authority executed on the earth each each world had a heaven and an earth a heaven and an earth they're governing principles I want you to look at Hebrews 1 it says God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, who he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Okay, 
Look at 2 Peter 3. But the heavens, whereby the world was then, was being overflowed with water, perished, and the world which is now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Okay, so um, the first world was destroyed because of sin, and that abound, and God regretted ever making man, Noah and the eight, you know, of his family were saved by the ark through the water. But sin kind of came through that, so um, it says death reigned from Adam to Moses. So in Moses, um, God installed a system to harness sin while preparing creation for the fullness of time and the coming of Christ. So the whole tabernacle was a shadow of the heavenly elements, of the things in heaven. And it foreshadowed the good things that was to come on the earth. So you can read about that in Hebrews 8, 9, and 10. So if you look in the first world destroyed by water, the dove had to find a landing. So first world destroyed by water, remember the dove had to find a landing. And then the second world begins with Moses in the law world. And then if you remember again, then, um, well, with the first one it says, my spirit shall not always strive with man. But then the... Uh, spirit descended upon Jesus like a dove. So at this point right here, Jesus' baptism happened. He comes up out of the water, and then the dove comes, uh, the spirit like a dove comes upon it. So it's kind of signifying these worlds. I'm going to read more scriptures and stuff to put this together for you, but first world, it was destroyed by water. Second world, by fire here in 70 AD. So you had um, the second world, the law world came into order, and like what we've been telling you about, um, the removal of the old began with Babylon. So remember, uh, the Israelites, they were exiled to Babylon, and when that happened, um, the, the Ark of the Covenant was lost, and so, they didn't have it. Remember, in the first temple, the first temple was destroyed. They had the Holy of Holies, and in the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. That was the presence of God. So God was in that system. But then, uh, the first temple is destroyed. There is no more Ark of the Covenant. And so when they're exiled to Babylon, they began their own system of Pharisees and Sadducees. So they started their own system when... That was the beginning of the removal of the old, but they they instituted their own system, and that begins with their exile in Babylon, and they carried that on. It should have ended with Christ. They sh they should have ended it. They were prophets sent to them. People were sent to them, and like it says, they killed all the prophets, and so they were given time after time to repent. And they just kept this old system. They just kept it, kept on going. And um, so then it has to be brought to its end at 70 AD with the removal of the second temple. So that gets taken out. So um, this statue, like in Daniel's dream, can turn into like a timeline for us because it shows that it started in Babylon and it ends with Rome and their army and soldiers and the total removal, the taking out of the temple at that time in 70 AD. It had to be taken out. The old had to be taken out. So there was the first world, it was destroyed by water. The second world was destroyed by fire. And then it talks about how we're in the third world. See, the third world began here, but it, there had to be an end to the second. So that was the end of the second. So then we're in the third world where it says we're in a world without end. But you look in um, Matthew 5.18, it says, For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So it's talking about this heaven and the earth. There's heaven and earth and earth. This one, this law world. Okay, it also says, For them would he have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world, has he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself? So in the end of the world, he appears. He's also the foundation of the world. Understand? So it also says, 
uh, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. This is not Cosmo's world, but it was that world. So the law world, it had to go. So first world, destroyed by water. Second, by fire. And then we are in the world of new heaven, a new earth coming in, a world without end, which Ephesians 3 tells us about. So um, it also says, let's see. If you look at these, for behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, for the former should not be remembered or come to mind. This is Isaiah 65. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants in your name remain. Isaiah 66. Um, Peter 3 says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. Um, Revelation 21, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. Wait, the sea no more. See, this is not talking about physical. If you look at um, Micah 7, it says, um, he will again have compassion on us and it will subdue our iniquities. You will cast our sins into the depths of the sea. So, um, okay. The temple, it used to have a sea. It was for cleansing. So if you look at Hebrews 8, it says, um, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Um, it also says, uh, let's see here, in that he says, A new covenant he has made, the first absolute. Now what is becoming absolute and growing old is ready to vanish away. He could have just said, and their sins were no more. If they are cast into the sea and there is no more sea in the new, then you cannot remember something that is no longer there. And again, you'll see um, him saying how the first is now absolute and growing old and ready to vanish away. The old had to be removed. So once again, first world destroyed by water. He says, never again. Second world destroyed by fire. He says, never will be seen again. Now, new heaven, a new earth, a world without end. Okay, so look at uh, Matthew 5, 14. You are the light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Revelations 21. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, the new Jerusalem, the holy city, is not Jerusalem. It's now us. The Jews were God's people from a natural seed line. Now we are born of God, and those who receive Christ are God's people. So those who are in Christ. We are that holy city set on a hill, the light of the world, whose builder and maker is God. Um, also, in 1 Peter it says, You also, a living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. So God is building his city of living stones, and we are the temple of God, and he dwells in us. And if he dwells in each one of these living stones, his presence is throughout this holy city of who we are. Got it? Um, Revelation 21 talks of the new Jerusalem and the glory of that city. So uh, let's move on to this, though, too. Jesus taught that a new cloth cannot be used to fix an old garment and new wine into old wineskin, for both will be destroyed. So he also explained that change is not always easy and people are naturally inclined to hold on to the old rather than to receive the new. And we see this. We see this with Paul in letters. He had to constantly deal with people wanting to go back to the old system of the law. Um, I was going to read 1 Corinthians 5, 7. It says... Uh, purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So the Bible it deals a lot with the removal of the old, and uh, Jesus confirmed that he would finish the work he came to do. And Hebrews 10 is a good summary of what the whole Bible is actually kind of about. So um, Paul, he keeps referring to sacrifices that could not get the job done, and then reveals a threefold purpose of the coming of Christ. Okay, so I'm going to read that to you. It says, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me, and burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. 
And then it says, And then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. He said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. So, um, the book of Revelation mostly deals with the uh, completion of the work that was started in Babylon. We talked about this, and it climaxed to the cross. So, the removal of that old system. You, I don't know, I'm just thinking, like, we really, we can't um, read Revelation apart from the whole Bible. Like, you have to understand, I think, the whole Bible to, like, really understand it. Anyways, uh, now, Hebrews 9.8. The whole, it says, the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Revelations 15, 5. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. Revelations 15, 8. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. So, um, was it John 4, 34? Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of them that sent me, and to finish the work. On the cross, Jesus cried out, It is finished. In Revelation, he said to John, It is done. So the final removal of the old system of worship is found in Revelation, and it took place as was prophesied. So this 40-year period from the crucifixion of 30 AD to 70 AD deals with the direct history of that time, and it all happened to a specific generation called the Wicked Generation. We are called the Christ Generation. So all things made new, new heaven, new earth, new governing principles, new covenant. We are in a world without end, and an increase of the kingdom. So. At the book, um, in the book of Revelation, at the end, he gives a warning to those he was to send the book to, uh, to not add to or take away from it, which was talking to the seven churches, and says how those um, who can testify of these things, which they surely could, would know that he was coming quickly. I honestly, like, I don't know how much more evidence we can provide you to really understand this. I hope it gives you a start. If you haven't really understood Revelation, that this will give you like a, a, a starting place to un really understand this. I really hope this helps in some way. So I hope you guys enjoy all this.